Возлюбленная Богом Церковь, начиная наше богослужение пред Господом, встанем, пожалуйста, и утвердим обетование, относящееся к преддверию нашей надежды. Да воцарится воскресение Христова в наших телах. Склоним наши головы в молитве. Дорогой Небесный Отец, во имя Иисуса Христа, мы благодарны имени Твоему Святому за вновь представленную привилегию быть на месте всем, которое очертила десница Твоя для поклонения Святому имени Твоему. И ныне позволь наследию Твоему во имя крови завета подняться на вершины для нас недосягаемые и сокрушить всякое бремя и запинающий нас грех. Да будут прокляты в этом служении, как и прежде, все дела дьявола, болезни, нищета, преждевременная смерть, демоническая зависимость, всевозможные страхи, депрессии, разрушение, косность, невежество – все это да отступит от шатров святого народа Твоего. И ныне встань, Господи, на место покоя Твоего Ты и ковчег могущества Твоего, и да облекутся святые Твои спасением Твоим, и да возрадуются пред лицом Твоим. Дай нам больше от Духа Твоего, пропитай нас Духом Твоим святым, позволь нам найти светлое лицо Твое. Я представляю это служение в Твои божественные руки, веди его рукою превознесенную, великий Бог, Отец, Сын, Дух Святой. Аминь. Да благословит вас Господь, можете садиться. Yeah. 
And so before we begin to again submerge into our inheritance that God has placed into his word, the unchanging epigraph to the study of the word of God is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so for us as partakers of the body of Christ, to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and what is necessary to be done from our side so that we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so we put on the new way or form of life. Ephesians 4, 22-24 that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. 
And to fulfill this command, we know we need to utilize three charging and fundamental verbs, and these are put off, be renewed, and put on. Your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting questions will depend on whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath, or more specifically, will the completion of our salvation happen that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it and our names be forever blotted out of the Book of Life? In a particular format, we have already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the question what conditions are to be fulfilled so that by the means of an already renewed mind, we can begin the process of dressing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth. Linked to the clothing of ourselves and to our new person, we came to the conclusion that we need God's help, that is, we need His mercy. The means of receiving any kind of help from God, in this case His mercy, is prayer and worship. <clears throat> we more than once note that prayer is not just the conversation you have with God, but the lawful right that a person gives heaven to intervene on earth, and we give God this right upon his conditions. One of these prayers of David written in the 143rd Psalm, we see <clears throat> the conditions based upon which a person is called to give God the right to have his mercy intervene, intervene in our life. This has been the subject of our study. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in you and in your sight no one living is righteous, for the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me to dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake, for your righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. An amazing place of scripture and prayer that the Holy Spirit would like the church to use these words of prayer and begin to pray these words, understanding them, fully understanding them. Therefore, to be heard by God, David needed to present to God a basis, a cause, or a particular right that would be able to serve as sufficient evidence before God to intervene into David's life with his faithfulness and his righteousness. And such evidence in this particular prayer were ten arguments that David presented to God saying, Hear me. Hear my prayer in your faithfulness and your righteousness. Hear my prayer because I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. Hear my prayer because I spread out my hands to you. Hear my prayer for in you do I trust. Hear my prayer because I lift up my soul to you. Hear my prayer because in you I take shelter. Hear my prayer for you are my God. Hear my prayer for your name's sake. Hear my prayer for your righteousness' sake, and hear my prayer, for I am your servant. In the previous services, we had already studied the nature of the first argument that gave God the lawful right to stand on the side of David in his oppositions against his enemies, and stopped to study the second argument. This is evidence of the fact that David abided in the memories of the days of old and all of the deeds that God had done in those days. We note that this is a fairly important part of faithfulness and righteousness in which David continued and what he presented to God in prayer as an argument, saying, Hear me. 
because I remember the days of old and all your works done by you in those days. Therefore, to keep within your heart the memories of the olden days and all of the works of God that God had done in those days, this in essence is to keep in your heart faithfulness and righteousness that testify before God of the results of the great work of His redemption, giving God the ability to reveal within our heart the multitude of His mercies. All of these <coughs> ten arguments are the work, the great work of God's redemption. In other words, to be heard by God in the revelations of his Urim, it is necessary to keep within your mind the works of God in his Thummim that God had done in the days of old. For this reason, we came to the, to the necessity to study a series of such questions. Who or what, in its essence, is the remembrance of the works of God imprinted in the days of old? What purpose is the remembrance of the works of God called to fulfill imprinted in the days of old, what price is necessary to be paid to have this remembrance of the works of God, and what results follow from having in yourself the remembrance of the works of God done by Him in the days of old or imprinted upon the tablets of our hearts. Studying the first question, what by itself is memory, in its essence as well as its definition, we came to the conclusion that memory that is contained in a man identifies the essence of this person as well as his sovereign boundaries. It is who he is, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he, Proverbs 23, 7. A very interesting argument that he presented and a very interesting truth. A person himself is formed by his thoughts. Considering that memory is information contained in the form of thoughts, we keep upon the tablets of our heart and thereafter proclaim before God his works done by him in the days of old. We then transform into the image of our thinking, identifying within our heart the works of God done by him. From our side, this is the right that we give God for the entry of his mercies into our life. It is written in Jonah 2.7, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Therefore, keeping within your heart the mem mem memories of the works of God done by him, when a person calls and presents this evidence, then his prayers will absolutely reach the temple of the Holy God and God will respond. Keeping again within your heart these memories of the works of God done by Him in the days of old, we blot out of our memory the works of men as well as the information that has been passed down to us from the sinful life of our parents. Our cells are programs, a living program, and we are carriers of this information, this program, and they immediately already are with a program when we're born. When we're born, we're born with a program of curse, the sinful life of our parents that has condemned us. But when we meet the life of God with the mercy of God, with the redemption of God, and when we look at what God has done in his works of redemption, and we write this into our heart, then writing this, this writing blots out, the writing itself blots out, when I say, Lord, I refuse and I reject this sinful life of my parents, this this, uh, this genetical code that's been passed down, this is good and we have that right. But in this moment, when we say this, it's not blotted out yet. But when we write upon the tablets of our heart the great works of God that he has done in his works of redemption for us, then they are blotted out. And the opposite effect, when we focus your eyes and your thoughts upon the works of men, we blot out the memory of the works of God within our heart, and in this way deprive ourselves of the right to eternal life, and ourselves condemn ourselves to perish in the, into the lake of fire. The memory of a person by himself 
is the strength and weapon of a man, and if you take this memory from him, he will appear as a destroyed city. Psalm 9, 6, O enemy destructions are finished forever, and you have destroyed cities, even their memory has perished. Remembrance of the works of God in the heart of a person is the inheritance of Christ, and this inheritance is passed down exclusively from one righteous generation to another. But you, O Lord, shall endure forever in the remembrance of your name to all generations. Psalm 102, 12, the remembrance of the works of God sealed upon the heart of a person is the holiness of God and the component of his unfading glory. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his. Psalm 34. The program of God, it is not abstract, it is only functioning, the program of God, when it's in the heart of a person. Out of the uh, program, out of your heart, it does not work, doesn't function. Based upon the many sentences in Scripture, all of the mir miracles and works of God that were done by Him in the days of old is a revelation of who God is to us and what He has done for us. He has made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Psalm 111.4 Studying the second question, what purpose is the remembrance of the works of God done in the days of old, written upon the tablets of our heart, called to fulfill in our relationship with God? We, in a particular format, have already looked at three components that serve as a memory before God and stop to study the fourth component. This is the breastplate of judgment that contains in itself the mystery of the Urim and the Thummim, by the means of which God was able to hear man, and a man was able to hear God. The first component of the remembrance of the works of God between God and man is the remembrance of the covenant upon the tablets of our heart that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Exodus 2, 24, 25. So if we have a, a connection and are a family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we, we, in our heart, we are connected to them. When we pray, God will remember us because of that covenant that God made, not with us, but with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When we are binded as a family to this root system, then it also, this blessing passes on to the descendants of Abraham. The second component of the remembrance of the works of God between God and man is a place of worship where God records his name. And this is, of course, the Church of Jesus Christ. When we are a part, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, and we begin to pray, and we have evidence that we are part of his body, God will then remember us. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings. And this is, of course, talking about prayer. Your sheep and your oxen, in every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. God records his name upon Zion. The third component of the remembrance of the works of God between God and man are the two precious onyx stones that were present upon the shoulders of of the ephod of the high priest. Exodus 28, 9 through 12. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six names on the other stone, in order of their birth. With the works of an engraver in stone, like the engraving of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel, you shall set them in settings of gold. And you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel, so Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. Exodus 28, 9 through 12. We looked at the uh, memorial, uh, this being as a memorial, a blessing and cursing symbol, lying blessing and cursing, six tribes upon Mount Gerizim and the other on Mount Gebal both stood, six tribes there, six tribes there, and the six tribes from the other and the, from the one and the other, every time they spoke a blessing and a curse, they connected 
confirmed them and they confirmed all these blessings, they confirmed all, confirmed all the curses and so they began to function. And so a person, who, whatever he may sow, he will reap. He sows blessing, he will reap blessing. If he sows curse, he will reap curses. And so when we have this teaching about the blessing and cursing and we can present uh, before God that we accept this today, the so-called tolerant Christianity do not accept this teaching. They don't exist. This the, the, they don't have this existence of this position in God. They 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 have tolerance. Uh, they just want blessing, and they allow in their mind. Uh, all going to go to heaven. They allow this in their mind. Uh, gays and lesbians, Democrats, whoever else they want, uh, but people destroy uh, the... Uh, destroy the uh, norms of, of the people. They destroy the, the normalcy of the people and their... Uh, and the respect of the people and they uh, support these things. If God may uh, created theocracy in the church, the country can only be led by a king if he has all the power. That is when peace will exist in that kingdom. Uh, otherwise, there will always be uh, a rise, uh, there will be an uprise of so-called uh, terrible uh, people mainly in the Democrat, uh, in the, in the Democrat uh, groups that will uh, protest and look at, look at the, the, all those who were supporters of Obama. They're in panic. The Democrats supported the, the smaller groups and not the, and not, the uh, uh, not the most part of the people who are decent and are not this way. So we have been studying the fourth component of the remembrance of the works of God in our heart, and this is the breastplate of judgment upon the breast, uh, chest of the high priest that contains in itself the uh, urim and the thummim by the means of which God is able to hear us and we hear God. We note that the breastplate of judgment that lay next to the heart upon the chest of the high priest is fundament fundamentally different from other items that also served as a memorial before God in their status and their extraordinary and purpose. Unlike the other items that were memorial before God, the breastplate of judgment was a continual memorial before God. God remembered after 430 years, he remembered his children and the covenant he made Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But this is a continual memorial before God. Therefore, the breastplate of judgment as an item of continual remembrance or a continual memorial before God is a symbol of the format of continual prayer. Prayer that is not in accordance to the requirements and characteristics of the breastplate of judgment does not have the right to be called prayer because only the format of continuous prayer presented in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest gives us the right to enter into the holy place as kings and priests of God. And we are called to present the interests of the judgments of God in accordance to those commandments and statutes and identify the union, union of the teachings of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in in it with thanksgiving, Colossians 4.2. Continuity, continuity in prayer is being vigilant, standing guard at the door of your heart, which is called to deliver us from the coming trials. Such vigilance is identified as a bright, brightly burning lamp that identifies the condition or state of our heart. Luke 21.36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all those things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21.36. The building order of the breast plate of judgment presents the demands that the true worshiper of God needs to have whom God seeks. Breaking the order of building of the building of the breastplate of judgment, the breastplate of judge, judgment identifying the state and nature of the worshiper is not able to be called the breastplate of judgment. John 4, 23, 24, but your, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Upon practice, worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth includes not peddling with the truth when 
pursuing the goals that God has placed in Scripture, as people have done in all times and many do today because of their stiff neck and their hypocrisy and greed. We note that in the Septuagint, that is the translation in he from the in Greek language, uh, translation from the Hebrew language, the breastplate of judgment is called the sign of justice. The symbol of the breastplate of judgment is revealed as the conscience of a man purified from dead works. The conscience condemns us when we place God's laws there, it begins to condemn, uh, condemn or justify us correctly. In this way, specifically, the conscience that is purified of dead works with the writing of faithfulness and righteousness upon its tablets will identify the nature of true worshippers that will give God the right to act in them and through them upon planet Earth. And it is these kinds of worshippers that the Heavenly Father seeks for Himself. We, in a particular format, have already looked, studied the measurements and the materials from which the breastplate of judgment was supposed to be built, <clears throat> and now have been studying the next requirement, which states, and Exodus 28, 17 through 21. And you shall put settings of stone in it, four rows of stones. First row shall be serious, topaz, and emerald. They shall be the second, turquoise, sapphire, and diamond. Third row, jacinth, agate, and amethyst. And the fourth row, beryl, onyx, and jasper. They shall be set in gold settings, and the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engraving of a signet, each one with its own name, they shall be according to the twelve tribes. And so the names were carved uh, from the other side. No one is, was able to see the names. People were able to see the precious 12 stones, but the names were inside. <clears throat> And so the 12 golden filigree settings of the breastplate of judgment is a symbol of God's judgment in the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, written upon the tablets of our heart that we as worshippers of God are called to present in our continual prayer. The 12 precious stones with the engraved upon them as a sign at names of the sons of Israel is in an image and format of our continual prayer presenting the perfect judgments of God. Continual prayer is a persistent prayer, an expression of our hope and reliance upon God. I will not leave until I receive. And such hope and reliance upon the tablets of our heart, presented in the twelve precious stones upon the breastplate of judgment, with the carved upon them twelve names of the sons of Jacob. Hebrews 10.35, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. It's talking about a, a persistent prayer. Hope with the absence of the breastplate of judgment upon the tablets of our heart, this breastplate containing the virtue of the twelve precious stones with the carved upon the twelve upon them the twelve names of the sons of Jacob Jacob cannot be called hope. The twelve names of the sons of Israel carved upon the twelve precious stones mounted into the golden filigree settings in the breastplate of judgment upon the tablets of our heart need to be written in accordance to the order of their birth. The building or preparing of the breastplate of judgment contains the same order that the twelve precious foundations of the wall of the New Jerusalem as well as the order of the twelve pearly gates have. However, they have a different function and different purpose. The order of the twelve precious foundations of the wall of the New Jerusalem contains in itself the strategy of the twelve elementary teachings of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, by which we are called to grow ourselves into the image of perfection that is in the likeness of our, of our God. The order of the twelve pearly gates of the New Jerusalem contains in itself the strategy of the trials of Christ, which are the keys to entering the kingdom of heaven, which is the tree of life that bears fruit of life each month. The order of the tree of life that bears fruit 12 times each month of the year contains within itself the strategy to be dressed into the new person, created in accordance to God in righteousness and holy truth. And we will remember that all the beauty and order of the temple was built for one holy item and for the sake of one single item, and this was the golden ark of the covenant. The same thing with the ephod of the high priest, with the connected to it breastplate of judgment. It was created for and served only one holy item. This item very accurately was called to duplicate and fulfill the function of the golden ark. This was the urim and the thummim. The golden ark as well as the breastplate of judgment symbolically represented the conscience of a man that is cleansed from dead works. The urim and the thummim is a light and perfection 
light and the right and a revelation and truth. The Ten Commandments that were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant was the truth, and this truth upon the breastplate of judgment is the Thummim. The revelation that a person could receive at the mercy seat or the lid of the Ark of the Covenant is the Urim in the breastplate of judgment. Therefore, only a person that contains a conscience that is cleansed from dead works or a wise heart upon the tablets of whom the truth is written can be a worshiper of God. This is the Thummim. That is why the revelation of God, which is the Urim, was able to be only within the boundaries of the truth in the form of the Thummim. That is the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. As it is written, I have put wisdom in the heart of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you. Exodus 31, 6. It's talking about the building of the house of God that God desired to live in. Here we're talking about the quality of wisdom that is contained in the Thummim and the Urim and about the fact that those who carry the Thummim and the Urim are worshippers of God and possess the immune system of the Holy Spirit. Deuteronomy 33, 8-11 And of Levi he said, Let your Thummim and your Urim be with your Holy One, whom you tested at Massa and with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah, who say of his father and mother, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers, nor, nor does he know his children, for they have observed their word and kept their covenant. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the work of his hands. Strike the loins of those who rise against him and of those who hate him, that they rise not again. And so the carriers of the Urim and the Thummim have a specific protection from uh, uh, of a protection of God, and those who bless them will be blessed, and those who curse them, he says, it says here, strike the loins of those who rise against him, and those who hate him, they, that they may not rise again. Looking at this blessing that Moses, the man of God, blessed Levi with, we can see that people that join themselves to the chosen by God nation but who confront those who carry the Thummim and the Urim and hate those who carry it because they hate them because they themselves don't have the Urim and the Thummim, have an undesired future in the lake of fire with ashes and brimstone, although they think they're going to heaven. In a particular format, we have already studied the first five qualities of a worshiper in the virtue of the five precious stones, the ruby, topaz, emerald, carbuncle, and sapphire. They have upon them carved like on a sign at the names Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, and Dan. By them, God was able to continually reveal his interests upon planet Earth and stop to study the sixth quality of a worshiper revealed upon the breastplate of judgment of our heart in the virtue of the precious stone diamond. The sixth quality, the sixth name in the second row from the bottom upon the pre precious stone of the breastplate of judgment of our heart is the name of the sixth son of Jacob, Neftali, which means wrestler. And Rachel's maid, Bila, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With the great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Genesis 37, 8. We note that the diamond is a brilliant stone, and the word brilliant really doesn't apply to any other stone except for the diamond. This includes gemstones faceted in some other kind of way that isn't the brilliant shine and polish of a diamond. The diamond or the brilliant stone is a pure carbon, and that is why it possesses such hardness or solidity. From ancient times, the diamond was considered a symbol of power, success, luxury, and victory. The diamond was valued for its healing qualities, durability, and, of course, its aesthetic qualities. Only people belonging to higher class were allowed to wear decorations with diamonds. Considering the meaning of the name Naphtali, wrestler carved upon the precious stone diamond, a weapon we need to utilize to confront the battle against our enemies, this is continual prayer in the power of the Holy Spirit that is in accordance to the requirements of the precious diamond stone faceted with a brilliant polish. According to the Jewish rabbinate, the name of God we see revealed in the precious diamond stone in Hebrew is El Hai, which, when translated, means God is alive. Therefore, based on the definition of the name Naphtali upon the precious diamond stone, we can conclude that the function of the sixth principle placed into the foundation of our continual prayer, with which we need to be a continual memorial before God, is our ability to allow the Holy Spirit to abide with us in our prayer battles against the powers of hell which confront us when we fulfill the will of God by the name of the living God. 
Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication, in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Ephesians 6, 18. Practically with this name, Israel was to vow the name of the living God, and every time they would vow, they would say, living is the God before whom I stand. And every time Samuel or Elijah and the other prophets, David also, any oath or vow that they made and they spoke, and between each other if they made an oath, they always vowed with the name of the living God. May the Lord live before whom I stand. And so the Holy Spirit conjoins us in our prayer battle upon one condition, and that is when our prayer satisfies the requirements of the perfect will of God contained upon the tablets of our heart in the conditions of the breastplate of judgment. But the Lord is the true God, He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath the earth will tremble, and the nations will not be able to endure His indignations. Jeremiah 10.10 10. In Hebrew, alive or living, when it comes to God means abiding who is one with unconditional authority one who defines Genesis creating a Genesis holding a Genesis keeping a Genesis ruling over Genesis and commander and Lord of the Genesis and Joshua said, it's talking about uh, to, the, to Israel, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hevites and the Perizzites and the Girishites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. So to be able to have him drive them out, they needed to uh, collaborate with the name of the living God. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of the earth, shall rest on the waters of the Jordan, that the water of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that came down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. Joshua 3, 10 through 13. To stop the waters of the Jordan that represent death, you need to collaborate with the name of the living God. The nations living upon the territory of the land of Israel, that is our primary enemy, symbolize our genetic program, which we have inherited from the sinful conduct of our fathers. Sinful, sinful conduct of our fathers is the sinful life, identifying the program of the second death or eternal death. And to blot out the program of death from your essence, it is necessary in your prayer battle to counter or replace it with the program of life that is contained in the name of the living God presented upon the tablets of our heart, in the breastplate of judgment upon the precious diamond with the name of Neftali. Therefore, based on the characteristics contained in the virtue of the name of God El Hai, or God is alive, we can conclude that the quality of a worshiper contained in the name of the living God is called to demonstrate a limitless or unconditional power of God over Genesis in the allotted to us time and boundaries. Continuing, so we, by the means of confession of the faith of our heart, present the characteristics of the living God in our continual prayer before God. It is necessary in the allotted to us time and boundaries of our dwelling to be dressed or clothed into the life of God, that is, our inner person in the resurrection of Christ. To present the living God is possible presenting the living God is possible in the new person or being dressed into the new person and to present the virtues of the and qualities of a worshiper worshiping in spirit and in truth in the qualities of the precious diamond presenting the living God with the carved upon it name of Neftali whose name means wrestler or a man giving the Holy Spirit the ability to battle together with him against the organized powers of hell of darkness confronting us when we fulfill the will of God we turn to the significantly important characteristics contained in the name of the living God, identified, un identifying virtues of the brilliant diamond that every worshiper of God needs to possess in their prayer battle, identifying the qualities of the name Neftali. This is why it is necessary for us to determine what goal that God has in his intentions when he are, urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer. Also, in what way and upon what conditions 
princes God able and desires to give man the right to become a warrior in prayer so that man may present the interests of God and implement or actualize his inheritance in God. Based on scripture, to be a warrior in prayer is the lawful and privileged inheritance of the holy men of all times. Secondly, this is their primary or first most purpose that is revealed in their calling to trample upon uncleanness and the unclean in their prayer battles. This is one of the greatest positions that is gifted by God to man, in which a person becomes a king and a priest to God and is seen by God as a brilliant stone of the diamond stone with the name Naphtali. The prayer of a warrior in prayer is a sacral or holy mystery that has an unearthly genesis. Therefore, in, it is inaccessible and is unable to be comprehended with the human mind or human abilities. From all forms of service, this form of prayer is the most difficult form of service that most Christianity, for the most part, avoids, forsakes, and refuses. 1 Timothy 1.18 This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare to define and build a specific system that will help us comprehend the signs identifying a warrior in prayer that would be able to be based on specific commandments of God and upon specific fulfillments of these commandments. Based upon the revelations written in Scripture, a prayer in the qualities of a warrior in prayer, identified by the virtues of the diamond, needs to be relentless or continual, persistent, diligent or zealous, with boldness, with reverence, with faith and hope upon God, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, in the Holy Spirit or praying in tongues. And so we will turn to the first of the components, the nature of prayer itself, which is the foundation for the rest of the components, identifying a warrior in prayer. This is continuity in prayer. And we'll remember that however its inner essence in its inner essence, a warrior and prayer is, is how his prayer will be. Prayer has a supernatural beginning. We will remember that continuity in prayer from a warrior in prayer, we will remember also the Holy Spirit and the Son of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be a light, and there was light. Hovering. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. The, this word uh, is correct to the Hebrew word hovering. It means carried in himself the thoughts of God, was the carrier of the interests and desires of God, glided over the thoughts of God, moved at the speed of lightning over the thoughts of God, focused upon the thoughts of God, showed that he is ready to fulfill the thoughts of God, trembled and shook before the thoughts of God, ruled himself in himself over the thoughts of God, warmed and activated, activated thoughts of God to action, caressed the thoughts of God and surrounded and remained in the thoughts of God. So the Son of God, receiving the image of man, was supposed to discipline him in himself the qualities uh, that he had. When he was born, he was not born with these qualities. He was born as a regular person and needed to discipline in himself those qualities and virtues which he then had in heaven. And so, the Son of God, as the Son of Man, needs to be an example of a warrior of prayer for us and the example of the Holy Spirit, not looking at the fact that as prayer was done in the Holy Spirit and in the power of the Holy Spirit, his continuity in prayer was the result of his discipline because he, as the Son of God, received this quality by practice. Luke 22, 39 through 41. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. Accustomed to prayer is practicing a habit that is developed from continuity. So you're practicing a habit that is developed from continuation or continuity when a person disciplines himself and does something regularly at the same time. And so this person with time will have the need to do what he 
usually discipline themselves to do. A person becomes dependent from his very habit that he has practiced in himself and formed in, formed in himself. And with time, these habits become a quality of a person's character. And so the uh, habit of prayer is the work, the path of continual prayer and the character of the Son of God as a warrior in prayer. The Son of God as the Son of Man practiced these things and, and developed them uh, so that they became a regular thing for him. And this is for you not to fulfill your own desires, but God's desires. Only when prayer becomes a habit or a regular thing, it becomes continually wanted and is in accordance to the requirements to, of continual prayer. Colossians 4, 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Based upon scripture, any form uh, and type of prayer without the element of continuity does not find favor in God's sight, but quenches only our religious demands. And so our house of prayer then is transformed into a den of robbers. We will clearly keep in our mind that everything that God does did do, does today, and will do on earth, including the, the future of all men, needs to be done through the prayers of men that contain in themselves continuity. In scripture, the word continuity is something that exists and one that is applied and as a verb continuity as a name as a warrior in prayer as an action this is continual prayer and as a characteristic is one who is vigilant in prayer continual prayer is continually supporting that fire that is in our spirit having a continual relationship with the Holy Spirit that is not interrupted by sin to be continual in prayer is to be vigilant and stand guard of the interests of God this this is the position of fulfilling your calling to inherit rapture. And this means to be placed by God, to remain in your place, placing boundaries for yourself that are placed by God. Keep these boundaries from the attempts of the devil, not go out of the boundaries of your responsibility, not bend away from your goals, to be vigilant with thanksgiving and restore a destroyed foundation. <clears throat> That's why in our service to God in the virtue of a warrior in prayer, we always see the undeviating requirements, holy instructions, necessary warnings, exceptional requests, and immediate military orders. We see these in the Word of God. In the dictionary defining the word continual, we see it as uninterrupted, one that does not stop, faithful, uh, eternal, and does not change in its habits and its direction. In scripture, this word is, first of all, the name of God, where we see his virtues and where we see his characteristics or qualities. This is the name faithful that contains in itself continuity and unchangingness. Now I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war, Revelation 19.11. This is, of course, a parable or an allegory. What do you think? Upon what horse was he riding? What is this white horse? And what are the war horses that followed him also? These are our new bodies. The horse is our new bodies. In the allegory, our bodies will be so glorious that as right now our body is an instrument that you use to perform righteousness before it was for unrighteousness and so the horse emotions and feelings but these will be different feelings this will be the white pure renewed the new body that's in the likeness of Jesus Christ and so this means that they follow already in the new bodies that's what the sim that symbolizes and so some people think that they really will be on white horses following Jesus. These will be your new bodies. In Hebrew, faithfulness of God is in the names Yahweh Ele Elohim. The full meaning of this is one who is strong, who uh, abides himself or binds himself. 
now and forever. And so this Yahweh Elohim is mentioned 324 times in Scripture because of this characteristic of God, faithfulness, and, the, and his name faithfulness in prayer, we need to see these things and apply them to our prayer to receive, to practice this, this uh, uh, practice and to develop the faith of our heart. We need to continually listen to the word of God. In order to possess continual prayer and to discipline yourself, we need to continually listen to the word of God, hear it. The church is created for this very purpose. When we continually Tuesday, Friday, Sunday a person comes, he can practice in himself the habit and he will be pulled, he will have the desire and only then will he be as a prayer, a warrior in prayer, a person cannot be a warrior in prayer if he will not come on all services upon the condition of course uh, 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 there are exceptions if you're learning or go, you were working or got sick and God will not uh, uh, see this as a sin but where he'll see where he could have and didn't this is that moment that God will see that this person could and went when you practice these things when you come here this is house of prayer we pray when we hear the word of God this is an element of prayer as well listening to the word of God is an element of continual prayer as well as faith in the format of faithfulness and continuity in prayer happens when we continually listen to the word of God so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God Romans 10 17 if you don't have enough faith that means you're not continually listening to the word of God listen to the word of God continually turn it on at home and you'll see that in the needed moment when everything's shaking you will have the faith because it happens because you continually listen the next condi condition of identifying continual prayer after listening to the word of God is studying and meditating what you heard about God and about his goal. We need to meditate about who God is for us and his character Isaiah 45 23 I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow every tongue shall take an oath he swore by himself by himself and so we are I have sworn myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath Isaiah 45 23 <coughs> And so people who do not know God, the unclean, will not vow with God's name or make an oath with God's name. They'll say, they will not say, God, living is the God before whom I stand. When you begin to shake and the devil approaches you or thoughts of, of doubt, you need to tell your thoughts, living is the God before whom I stand. I will not shake when I, in my hope in God. And when you begin to say this, the doubts that are in your mind, you'll see how quickly it will run away. The ingredients that are included in the format of continuity is the faith of the heart without which it is impossible to please, with, without which you're not able to please God, it is impossible to please God. And so continuity and faithfulness are often uh, next to each other. <clears throat> and so faithfulness... The next condition in receiving continuity in prayer, having continuity in prayer, is accepting over yourself that person that is the delegated authority of God from whom we receive this word, choosing people for his word and God never ever counsels with those people uh, that, that with those who uh, go to listen to his, his uh, delegated people, he just sends them. And the, as you remember, God did not counsel with the Israelite nation who to pick. God did not counsel with the church uh, who to pick when Apostle Paul was sent. And so to have, with, have within our prayer the element of continuity or faithfulness, continuity is 
the ingredient, ingredient of faithfulness. We need to receive or accept that person that God has trusted his sermons to. The next condition in receiving continuity, having continuity in prayer is not to just abide in the teaching of the apostles, but uh, in communication with each other and in breaking of the bread. Acts 2, 41, 42, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Cont and they steadfastly, that's continually. Now let's turn to the next component of the nature of prayer. And this is... Diligence. Second Chronicles 15, 15. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with all their soul, and he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest all around. And so in this place of Scripture, diligence is the great desire or great hunger and thirst to find God or to get to know God. This is your inner state. And when God gives a response to this kind of thirst or hunger, <clears throat> the, in, in his peace, then the peace is receiving the Holy Spirit as the Lord of your life. <clears throat> as to, the Lord gives us the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life. A person will have peace only when he, when the Holy Spirit will be his Lord and his Master and not his guest. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of the heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 7, 37 through 39. When the rivers of living water flow from a person, then this kind of person is in complete peace. It can't be that a person not be in peace, but his rivers would flow. Because a person thinks if he speaks in tongues, these are rivers. These are not rivers. These are not rivers. When rivers are flowing, rivers of living water, is when a person with diligence found us, uh, uh, was seeking God and God revealed himself to him and he found rest in him. He doesn't just sing under the protection of your wings. You're actually in, under these wings. You're actually present. You won't say, I will be under his protection. You are under his protection. There, that's a, there's a big difference. And so as soon as per loses the element of diligence when a person seeks to know the will of God, the Holy Spirit abandons this person and this person loses then the position of a warrior in prayer and loses peace. The word diligence includes these kinds of definitions. Favor to uh, and fulfillment of the will of God. We're talking about diligence here. Favor and to the fulfillment, the desire to uh, fulfill the will of God, and, uh, being attracted to fulfilling the will of God, being open to fulfilling the commandments of God, the desiring good that comes from the good will of a man, knowing uh, the good will and depending from that good will, finding pleasure in obeying the will of God, caring and making sure to take care of fulfilling the will of God and be finding pleasantness and fulfilling the will of God. And so diligence in prayer is linked to the willing and desired choice and decision of a person to give God the right in his prayer to fulfill his will in his life, God's will in his life. And so now let's look in what situations or in what components in Scripture we see diligence in prayer. First, a diligent prayer is seen by God as an offering that is brought, brought by a prince voluntarily that is equal to the offering of the seventh day where a person seeks the favor of God and the revelation of his paths. <clears throat> Diligence in prayer is like fulfilling the Sabbath day, the day of peace. Exodus 46.12 Now when the prince makes a voluntary burnt offering, 
or voluntary peace offering to the Lord, the gate that faces toward the east shall then be opened for him, and he shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offering as he did on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go out, and after he goes out, the gate shall be shut. Hmm. <clears throat> Ezekiel 46, 12. If you remember, only in the Sabbath day was uh, a, the prince was to come, and there's a, in Deuteronomy it is written when the prince comes on the Sabbath day into the temple of God, the gates are opened, he comes to the gate, to the threshold. <clears throat> And he stands there with his gift, and the priest then takes this gift and brings it in to the holy place. And when all of this is finished, he returns. But when a prince wants to offer not just on the Sabbath, to communicate with God not just on the Sabbath day, he wants to voluntarily, he wants to, then the gates will be opened as they did for him, they open the gates for him as they did on the Sabbath. And so this diligence is connected to the Sabbath or fulfillment of the Sabbath day. Here's what Moses says about this. Exodus 33, 13, 17. Now therefore I pray if I have found grace in your sight, <clears throat> show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. <clears throat> Here we talked about when a person has the desire to know God, this is diligence. We studied what is diligence. Here a person comes with diligence. He has the desire to know God. He says, if I found favor in your sight, open up your path or your ways for me so that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. <clears throat> and when God sees this kind of diligence, that a person seeks God with diligence, he's seeking the revelation of God and his path. He's not looking for wealth and a better life on earth. He says, open up your path so that I may know you. He doesn't say, Lord, heal me and protect me, you see. He wants to know God himself. He wants to know his path. And then God says to him, about what you say I will do because you have found grace in my sight and I know you by name when a person brings offers his prayer with diligence he obtains favor and God then says I know you by name if there's no diligence God does not know us by name he does not know us by name when we come and he says who are you who are you Tell me your name. The name is diligence. Present this diligence. The virtues, the virtues of our name. If there's no diligence, we don't have a name before God. Secondly, a diligent prayer is seen in Scripture as a diligent obedience to the voice of God, that is, obedience to His authority, where a person binds himself to the Holy Spirit or places himself in willing dependence of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 6.15 even those from afar shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. So the promise is given, promises are given, Gifts are given, rewards are given for diligence. Other people will take part in building yourself up as a temple. You yourself can't build yourself up. All those scriptures say, build yourself into a spiritual house, a holy uh, temple. We ourselves alone, though, can't do this. Why? Because others also need to help us. Because we don't have all of the ingredients to make of ourselves. Because in the body of Christ, there are a lot of members in each one has their own work and each due to their gifts by depending on their gifts do something in the church for each other and when we do something one for the other we will do for each other upon the condition that we are, will diligently obey the Lord our God and this is diligently obeying God and lonely this <coughs> obeying and that means obeying his delegated people and God will then surround us with those people that will help us build ourselves up into the house of 
God into a royal priesthood. Alone, none of us will never be will ever be able to do anything. Paul couldn't alone <coughs> build himself. He, uh, Paul said, "Pray about me." To pray about each other is <coughs> they will come from afar and take part. Do you know how many people pray for us today, for our church, in other countries, people? Our sister churches are always praying about us and ble blessing us. They look, watch, and with jealousy, not a jealousy that's, that's bad, but a, a good kind of, and they, they, we receive this from you and we bless you, we pray for you is what they say and God sees these from afar these prayers they will come but we pray for them and they will come and will come and help build the temple of the Lord if you shall diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God this is a part of diligent prayer Jeremiah 27 O Lord you induced me and I was persuaded you are stronger than I and have prevailed I am in derision daily everyone mocks me Jeremiah 27 and so diligence is linked to you being your your uh, attractiveness to God or you indu <coughs> being induced by God being uh, this pull to know God, he prompts this, he, he pulls a person to himself, but not all respond to that request or that, uh, that gesture. If he attracted you and you're attracted, then you have this diligence and not look at the fact that you are uh, mocked every day, you have something between, there's something between you and God that others won't have. God attracted you and you were attracted you were attracted by him and he by you <clears throat> you didn't just end up in his nets but you f were seeking these nets to end up in god's net nest uh, nets <clears throat> for as many as are led by the spirit of god these are the sons of god romans 8 14 you can't be led by the Spirit of God without diligence. You need to uh, bind yourself. This is diligence. John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This is diligence. To follow after him. We ourselves have binded. He doesn't bind us. We bind us. We bind ourselves. And we follow after him, and we can't live without him. Third, a diligent prayer without a diligent offering to God dressed in the format of a tithe is a counterfeit and a falsification of diligence. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. Exodus 25, 1 through 1 and 2. <clears throat> Pretty much, do not offer to me without diligence. Again, that speak to children of Israel that they may bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. They came both men and women, as many as had a willing heart. Willing heart is diligence and brought earrings, nose rings, rings, necklaces, all jewelry of gold. That is every man who made an offering of gold to the Lord. Exodus 35, 22. There, at that time there was no money and so what they had were golden and silver items and clothing and so forth. And everything they can bring to God was these things, these treasures. And so from this, God then built the temple. The spiritual house God will build of our tithes. We need to understand this is not just honoring God, but this is also a building material that will build our spiritual house, will turn us into a spiritual house. This is what this means. Here's what Apostle Paul says about this. 2 Corinthians 8.12 For if there is first a willing mind he's talking about bringing of tithes it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. 
2 Corinthians 9, 1, 2. Now concerning the man ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians was, and your zeal has stirred, uh, stirred up the majority. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. As you can see, if people would understand that without offering of tithes to God, they can't be built into a house of God. Because this is not just food. He says, so that there may be food in my house, but from this food, from this means, God builds us. He accepts each person. And so they brought, came and brought, and Moses, he then built the tabernacle with these things and God then came and lived in this tabernacle and they were able to come to the Lord God made this tabernacle in us will make in us together we will feel and understand this tabernacle understand this tabernacle but it will be within the person God wants one bringing diligently would become his tabernacle a person who does not bring to God does not honor God with tithes and offerings will never will not be able to be a temple of God will never be able to be built into a temple of God a person not paying not paying God but honoring God with his tithes I understand sometimes people not don't understand and say I pay my tithe you don't pay God this is his part this belongs to me God says give me my own this is very important to understand fourth a diligent prayer is an offering of thanksgiving in which a person by faith sees his deliverance from all misfortunes and thanks God for this. He sees with faith that he will be delivered from this sickness, he will be delivered from this dependence, he will be delivered from this weakness, and he sees this by faith and thanks God for this. And this is called diligent prayer. Psalm 54, 6, 7. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eyes, my eyes have seen its desire upon my enemies. David saw these things when enemies were pursuing him all around. But he said, I will sacrifice freely to you, for you have delivered me out of all trouble and my eyes have seen this desire. And so where did this faith come from? That came from diligence. He came, he brought a acceptable offering to God. Fifth, a diligent prayer includes in itself a correct relationship to your church. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heeds heads of grain after him in, the, in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Ruth 2.2, 2, when she met Boaz, he told her, May your eyes be upon this field. Don't go from one field to another. Just gather here upon this, this field. Only when a person gathers can he receive uh, blessing he said be with my servants and he told them give to her add to her and he also added to her as well if you pay attention those were workers that worked for him but she did this for herself she did not work for him she was she was uh, gleaning in the fields uh, <clears throat> uh, for herself and he added more to her uh, to her gatherings and he told her listen to everything that he tells you and you know that in result he became uh, uh, he, he, he married her she married, Bo she, she had her son Boaz, or Boaz had a son, and from there came uh, David, if, as you know. 
He said to her, don't go to other fields. Stay on this field. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as it is the manner of some, but extorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And further, it says, if a person breaks this, then he will not have the opportunity to receive salvation. He loses his salvation. He doesn't have any opportunity then to uh, r restore himself with repentance if he abandons his field. The sixth, uh, diligent prayer that includes in himself the correct uh, your relationship to those who uh, who may offend you <coughs> without obedience to your masters is also a counterfeit oh with with fear and trembling will be a, a counterfeit or will be a falsified version of diligence Ephesians 6 5 through 8 bond servants be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ not with eye service as men pleasers but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good that who whatever good anyone does he will receive the same from the Lord each one of us have a job and when you do it with diligence from the soul then it is written you will receive a reward this is good with goodwill doing service as the Lord and not as to the Lord and not to men. A diligent per, uh, work, if a person does not work, uh, if a person doesn't work with diligence from his heart, it will not be uh, pleasing to God and it will not be a good work. <clears throat> Matthew 6, 14, 15. When we work with diligence, in our relationship with each other, we sometimes can hurt each other. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6, 14, 15. This is also diligence. <clears throat> And this is your inner uh, desire to please God. And in order to please God, we need to forgive people so that we can give God the ability to be the judge, not to uh, push him away as the, as the first judge, the primary judge. We give God the ability to avenge us. We accept in him the first judge, the primary judge, and God sees this. Attempt or pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. This is an element of boldness. We attempt to show the holiness of God and not being a part of evil or part of sin. This is what holiness is. If we will not have this separation from evil, from uh, sin, we will not see the Lord. Without this holiness, no one will see the Lord. If you sit at a table where there's alcohol and where people drink, you need to understand that you become a part of this wine. You say, well, I'm not drinking. But you're sitting together in the, at this table together with these people and drinking something else. You're sharing in, as in a banquet with, one, with these people who are doing such things. Don't sit at the table with those who drink because then you will not show holiness, but you need to show holiness and, and say, I can't eat and drink with you because here it, there is alcohol here. I'm a holy person. I'm not a part of evil. This evil, it has, it, it destroys more than drugs or accidents on the street if you, alcohol does. If you look, there's not, nowhere is there so much misfortune as with alcohol. People say 5, 10 people died. This is a tra uh, tra tragedy. But from alcohol, hundreds of thousands perish and die. Uh, from alcohol, no one sees this, that a husband comes drunk home and hits his wife and children. No one pays attention. These great leaders, so-called leaders, come home and destroy their houses. But because they can't fight with this, they just uh, agree with it. But you say, but here it's normal 
they just drink a little bit. Yeah, they just drink. But it's one thing when accidentally if I'm sitting at a table and I invited and suddenly this person orders wine. I, I ended up in a situation I invited guests and they brought their children and these children ordered wine. Of course, I did not stand up and leave. I said to these parents, you do, know, you do know from me this was not comfortable. But the parents said, well, they're adults. We didn't have the right to tell them. If I knew beforehand, of course, if there will be wine there, I will not go there. But this person using my kindness uh, ordered wine. I didn't stand up and, and leave, of course, in that situation, but inside I understood that if I stand up and leave, will I show holiness or not? I won't show holiness in that situation because they will not understand me. Those who will sit on purpose when they come and they drink, they will understand me, but these will not understand me. I'll tell him later that you can't drink wine, this is a sin. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, Matthew 5, 9. We're talking here about what diligence is. Without a person who does peace, or a peacemaker, a person is trying to uh, make people uh, be at peace with each other and not argue with each other. If a person is always uh, making two people argue, he is not a warrior in prayer. And the final, diligent prayer is the correct state of the human heart that shows diligence, the attempt to, a diligent attempt to live quietly and do your work with your own hands. That you, first, Thess uh, Thessalonians 4, 11, 12, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. A very important component. Lazy people are people who do not want to work and will live uh, parasites of, of, of the community that Apostle Paul said, if you don't work, you don't eat. God is a worker. He's not lazy. And so boldness and laziness, uh, they, they are our two opposites. They are opposition to one another, and we need to understand that. Considering that our time is up today, we who is comfortable to, can bend their knees uh, or sit in your seat or stand however you are comfortable uh, and we will thank God that he teaches us how to pray to enter into his presence Amen Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ we again and again worship in your house of prayer upon this holy place we thank you that you have attracted us and we're attracted to you. We thank you for the diligence that we have in ourselves. We can testify before your face that we have this diligence before your face because we, with desire, come here to listen to your words. And when we listen to you, you turn this into continual prayer. You turn this plus into diligence and you look at us with favor and you begin to reveal to us yourself. You begin to reveal your good intentions towards us. You reveal to us who you are for us and what you have for us in the future. You again and again give us light, hope and the hope not to step away from the goals that you've given and to proclaim our healing and freedom from all sorts of dependencies until we receive this freedom. Thank you in advance because we already have this freedom, this liberty in Jesus Christ. May your mercy be blessed for your people. May you 
Lift up your people and may you show your glory and dress your people into your resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son, by, and that is our new person that you are dressing us into. We thank you, Father, that for this wonderful resurrection that is our new person that you are intending to have us dressed into without each other we will not be able to be dressed into our new person without each other we will not be able to build ourselves into a royal house and a holy priesthood if we don't utilize those gifts that we've received from you by your grace allow your holy people your children to understand this that relationship with each other is seen by you as diligence that helps build our house may your mercy be blessed and again and again you said that this is one of your great strengths that you reveal to us if we present before your face that our prayer has in itself the element of boldness and diligence we present our boldness and diligence before you and we worship before you our great God Son and Holy Spirit Amen our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give to us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we proclaim our unchanging manifestation, I'd like to call out uh, George and Agnesa. I'd like, uh, they would like to restore their membership. They wanted to do this sooner. I will ask but he said I don't he says I don't know uh, why we need to renew it we've always been with you I understand but since you've been uh, out of this church in a different country for a while you sh should you're not uh, excluded in any way you're a member but in another place but you are a member of this specific church and so right now the time has come they've been wanting to uh, do this for a while some thought maybe they didn't and every church almost he comes uh, comes to me and asks can we do this a little bit sooner than we uh, and so right now we'll pray for them and restore their position as members uh, so that they be a blessing for the church and we will be glad to do this and may the Lord bless you stretch out your hand as a symbol for you before your God will pray and bless them and restore their position Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ we thank you for George and Agnesa they have returned uh, you tested them and you led them through a difficult path and they have learned much and here you will care for them and restore them here you will open up your gifts to them here and we thank you for this may they be a blessing and be blessed before your nation we accept them into this army and may they be restored as members here their position be restored and may the your blessing be on all of us together we thank you and we bless your great god son and holy spirit amen we congratulate you you can take your place and we together will proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen